In this video, I'll be going through the 2023 Waves paper. Question 1. Marco and Harvey head to the mall to buy props for the school show. Their first stop is the costume shop. The students start looking at hats in a concave mirror of focal length 25cm. The mirror image is initially real. Define the term real as it is used in this context. If we have a mirror, a real image happens when the rays converge in real space. Forming an image at a location that we could reach out and touch, as opposed to a virtual image where the rays diverge, meaning that nowhere in real space do they intersect, they only appear to behind the mirror in virtual space. The rays converge in front of the mirror in real space. Marco stands 40 centimeters in front of the mirror and the image is formed in the location shown below. Complete the diagram below to show how this image forms. Doing my best without a ruler, the first ray reflects symmetrically about the center of the mirror. The second ray travels parallel to the axis and then reflects through the focal. And the third ray passes through the focal and then reflects parallel to the axis. Calculate the magnification of the image formed. Magnification can be written as the distance of the image divided by the distance of the object, where we could also use the heights, but since we already have the distance of the object, 40 centimeters, we might as well use the distances. The trouble is, we don't have the distance of the image, so we need to find it. To do this, we can use Descartes' law, Solving this for di by first subtracting 1 over do from both sides and swapping them around. And now taking the inverse of both sides. Putting our numbers in where we were given the focal length at the start of the question. Which gives me 66.7 to 3 significant figures which we can now use in our magnification equation which gives me 1.7 to 2 significant figures. Harvey now stands 10 centimeters in front of the concave mirror. By using a ray diagram and calculating the image distance and magnification, describe and explain the nature of the new image formed. We can start by doing a quick ray diagram. We're recalling that our focal length was 25 centimeters which means that our object is going to be roughly around here. Drawing our rays, the first reflecting symmetrically about the middle, and the second traveling parallel to the axis, and then reflecting through the focal, we see that our rays diverge, meaning that to find where they intersect, we need to backtrace them, drawing our virtual rays, giving us a virtual image that is enlarged, upright, and virtual. And now not only has it asked us to do the ray diagram, it also wants us to do the calculations. To find the image distance, we can once again use Descartes' law, but to save a bit of time, we can use our pre-solved version from here. Where our new distance of the object was 10 centimeters. Which gives me negative 17 centimeters to two significant figures. Now we can find the magnification using the same equation that we used last question, which gives me negative 1.7 to two significant figures. Question two. The students walk past a wishing pond for a local charity. People throw coins in the water and these are collected at the end of the day. As the students sit on the side of the pond, they notice the coins appear closer to the surface of the water than they actually are. Name the physics phenomenon that causes the coins to appear closer to the surface than they actually are. This is refraction. The following diagram shows the light ray as it leaves the water. The refractive index of water is 1.33 and air is 1.00. Calculate the angle theta shown at the surface of the water. To do this, we can use Snell's law, where we'll make N1 our water, which has a refractive index of 1.33, which means that our theta 1 is just the theta that we're trying to find. 
This makes our N2 our refractive index of error, which is 1.00, and our theta2 is this angle here, which is 90 minus 40, which gives us 50. This is a classic trap that the examiners try to throw at you, where if you instead use the 40 degrees for theta2, you would only get an achieved mark for what is an otherwise merit question. Solving our Snell's law for theta1, which we'll do by first dividing both sides by n1, and then taking the inverse sine of both sides. Putting our numbers in, which gives me 35 degrees to two significant figures. The students notice a diamond in a jeweler's shop, they know total internal reflection is the main cause of the sparkle of the diamond. We're given the refractive index of the diamond, the critical angle of the diamond, and the speed of light in air. A ray of light passes through the boundary between air and the diamond. Calculate the speed of light in the diamond. To do this, we can use the equation on the formula sheet that N1 over N2 is equal to V2 over V1 where we can make our N1 the refractive index of the diamond, 2.42, which means that V1 is what we're trying to find, the velocity of light in the diamond. N2 is the refractive index of air, which we already know is 1.00 from the previous question. And V2 is the speed of light in air, which is 3 times 10 to the 8. Solving this equation for V1, which I'll do by first flipping both sides and swapping them around, Multiplying both sides by V2, and putting our numbers in, which gives me 1.24 times 10 to the 8 meters per second to three significant figures. State what happens to the frequency of the light as it passes into the diamond. The frequency of the light is unchanged, which is always the case with refraction. Using appropriate calculations show that the critical angle for the diamond is 24.4. If we have our ray starting in our diamond, with the refractive index that we were given in the last question, which is 2.42, our angle 1 is going to be the critical angle that we're trying to find, which will hopefully turn out to be 24.4, which means that N2 is the refractive index of air, which is 1.00, and at the critical angle, the angle at which it refracts is 90 degrees. Using Snell's law, where we can make life a little bit easier by noting that sine theta 2 is going to be sine of 90, and sine of 90 is 1, so we get n2 times 1, which is just n2. Now we can solve for our theta 1 by first dividing both sides by n1, and finally, taking the inverse of both sides. Putting our numbers in. Gives me 24.4407, which we can round to 24.4 degrees to three significant figures. Explain total internal reflection in terms of the conditions required and include a definition of the critical angle. Total internal reflection only occurs when a ray travels from a medium of high refractive index to lower. The critical angle is the incident angle at which the refracted ray travels along the boundary. Increasing the incident angle above this results in total internal reflection. Question 3. The students decide to try out some prescription glasses. They try out two types of glasses, both of the same shape and material, but with different thicknesses. How does the focal length of the thin lens compare to the focal length of the thick lens? If we have a thick lens, as opposed to a thin lens, the thick lens is going to refract a lot more aggressively, whereas the thin lens is going to refract much more gently. One way to think about this is this is a continuum from a circular lens all the way to basically a window pane, which is to say all the way from maximum refraction to no refraction at all. The thin lens will have a longer focal length. A different set of glasses has convex lenses with focal length 30cm. 
Complete the ray diagram below to show the position and appearance of the image produced. Our first ray goes straight through the middle. The second ray goes parallel to the axis and then refracts through the focal. As we can see, these rays diverge, meaning that to find their intersection, we need to draw virtual rays. And so we get our image somewhere around here, which is as best as I can draw it on my tablet. But as long as the image is enlarged, upright and virtual, and that your rays are drawn in the correct spirit, you'll get the full merit mark. The students walk further along the mall and hear music playing from a radio around the corner. At point A, they only hear the low pitch of a bass guitar and cannot work out the tune. At point B, they hear the bass guitar and the high pitch of an electric guitar playing the same track of music. Why do they hear the bass guitar and not the electric guitar at point A, even though they are both at the same volume? Your answer should identify the physics phenomenon and explain the effect of the corner on this process. You may use the diagram above to support your answer. And so we have our student and our speaker. And if we imagine the waves from our bass guitar, which are going to have a relatively long wavelength, at the corner they are going to diffract around, whereas the higher frequency electric guitar has a shorter wavelength, and so is not going to diffract as much. The phenomenon is diffraction. The bass guitar has a lower frequency and therefore a higher wavelength. The electric guitar has a higher frequency and lower wavelength. Larger wavelengths diffract further, allowing the bass guitar to be heard at point A. Later they pass by the hall, where a band is tuning their instruments and playing a single frequency. The hall has two open doors. The students notice the sound appears to vary in volume as they walk past the doors. Assume the tuning frequency is played at a constant volume. Through the use of appropriate diagrams and the use of physics concepts, identify, describe and explain the physics phenomena that are taking place to cause the sound to vary in volume. For this horrible question, I'm going to need to draw a two-point interference diagram, which I'll do my best. Where our peaks meet peaks, we have an antinodal line, and in between, we have nodal lines. And now, it wants us to do an information dump. This is a two-point interference pattern. Each door behaves like a wave source, from which waves diffract and interfere. Along our antinodal lines, peaks meet peaks and troughs meet troughs, resulting in constructive interference and high amplitude, causing areas of loudness. Along our nodal lines, peaks meet troughs, resulting in destructive interference and areas of low amplitude or quietness. 